text this morning is Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. This is God's word. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, we come to you asking and praying that by the power of your Spirit, you would open the eyes of our hearts, that we might understand what you have for us in these verses, that we might see you high and lifted up, exalted above the heavens, that we might see the way that you work in the life of your church, that we would be encouraged, that we would be challenged, that we would be reminded of your greatness and of your majesty. Teach us, Father, we pray, for we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Here again, we have a picture of the Lord pulling back for us the curtain so that we see more clearly a picture of the church. It's a short section that comes right before persecution that is about to come, but it's not here just for us to get a feeling of persecution coming on the church, but it's for us to see what God was doing. These verses tell us about the Lord, about the church, about the world that we live in. They tell us about the relationship between the Lord and his church and this world as well. What does the world think about the church? Increasingly, the world looks at the church with hatred. We see that. In America, we have not experienced that like some of our brothers and sisters in Christ experience in other places of the world, but we're seeing more and more of it. They would just rather we go away. Traditionally, the world is kind of, at least the world that we are exposed to, they've tended to think that we're irrelevant as the church, meaningless unnecessary. You know, if it works for you, good, I'm, I'm happy for you, but it just doesn't work for me. Living in a postmodern world where there are no absolutes, there's a sense that people think it's just kind of up to you, whatever you really want, that that's really what matters. And there are no absolutes, which in and of itself is an absolute statement, which negates that which follows, right? What do you think about the church? What does the church think about the church? Over the years, I've talked to lots of Christians who have been deeply hurt by other Christians. Some of us have been hurt by the church. Some of us don't trust the church. We want to hold the church at arm's length. And sometimes we think about the church and it just seems like it's powerless. It's unimportant. And as Christians, 
there's so many people that would say that their faith is in Christ, but the church, it's kind of take it or leave it. I'll go when I feel like it. I'll be engaged with other Christian people when I want to. Sometimes we just take it for granted, too. And we often tend to think the church is nothing special. Really? Look at these verses. Notice they come after the resurrection of Christ. Luke has given us an account of the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus. He has told us about the incarnation, that God in his love and mercy came to earth in the person of the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus, living a perfect life, demonstrating the truth of God's word and his kingdom, and then dying on the cross becoming the second Adam, becoming the sacrificial lamb of God, giving life to all those who look to him in faith and dying as a sacrificial lamb in place, in our place. Then he died and he remained, his body remained under the power of death for three days. And then on the third day, he rose from the dead. He overcame the power of death. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. And as he promised to his disciples, he sent the Holy Spirit. And the powerful work of God's Spirit indwelling all those who trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, making us alive because God takes us from death to life. It's his work. It's not ours that God powerfully gives us life. And so here this passage flows out of the finished work of Christ on the cross and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And notice what it demonstrates for us first. I didn't put this in your outline, but I want you to really understand this. This may be the most significant thing in a sense in this passage. This demonstrates to us the almighty power of the living God. How much do you think about God? Do you stop and think about God's character, his nature, what he's like? Scripture's full of it. But sometimes we just read for ourselves. What does this say for me? What does, how does this make me feel? What do I think about this passage? What does this text say? Notice what it tells us about God's almighty power. And I want you to think about the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question four. Maybe you don't think about that question and answer very often either, but what is God? God is spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Now think of it this way. What is God? God is spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, in his power. Sometimes even in the church, we think God is powerless. Oh, God can't do anything. I'm stuck. Prayer is kind of a last resort rather than the first line of attack. Think about what the Bible tells us about God. Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. God spoke matter into existence. 
I speak and my dog doesn't even respond to me. God spoke. He didn't break a sweat. He spoke stuff into reality. Scientists have overstepped their boundary where they've moved away from science into religion. But their basis is on there is no God. But they look at the beauty of this creation. Look at this time of year. The leaves change color into a beautiful panorama of the glory of God. And we're too busy to stop and look. God is almighty. He's created all things. Notice what the Lord tells us in Colossians 1 about God as sustainer. Verse 15. Speaking of Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You could spend a year on that verse. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This universe doesn't fly apart because Jesus holds everything together. Isn't that amazing? Think of Psalm 139. Psalm 139, God reminds us through David that God is the one who formed us in our mother's womb. God is the one who knit us together. God is the one who knows every one of our thoughts before we even think them. God is the one who has written every day that we will live in his book. God is all powerful. And sometimes we forget about the power of God. We get caught up in this world that we live in. Reformers, as they were seeking to bring the church back to the word of God, back to truth, they identified the true marks of the church. And listen to Ed Clowney, how he speaks about past president of Westminster Seminary. He says, the reformers continued to affirm the attributes of the church from the Nicene Creed. They protested, however, against the external and institutional way in which the Roman Catholic apologists interpreted them. <clears throat> As we have seen, they pressed for a biblical and spiritual understanding of the church's attributes. Above all, the reformers emphasized the meaning, what it meant to be an apostle. To be apostolic, the church must be built upon the doctrine of the apostles, 1 Corinthians 3 and Ephesians 2 and 3. Not the pretended chair of Peter, but the teaching of Peter was the real mark of apostolicity. The Reformation made the gospel, not ecclesiastical organization, the test of the true church. Yet the reformers, particularly in Calvinistic circles, sought biblical standards for the organization of the church. Three marks were defined in distinguishing a true church of Christ, true preaching of the word, proper observation of the sacraments, and the faithful exercise of church discipline. That's how he goes on. The New Testament grounds the church in God's revealed truth. The apostles established the church by preaching the scriptures and their fulfillment. 
The fellowship of the church in the book of Acts exists among those who continue in apostolic teaching, Acts 2.42. The growth of the church is described by Luke as the growth of the word in Acts. The ministries by which the church is built up are ministries of the word. The apostolicity of the church, therefore, means that the church is built on the foundation of the apostolic gospel. All other attributes of the church derive from this, that the true church of God is grounded on the word of God, and that God is powerful, alive, and active as the sovereign God, the almighty God working in and through his church in different times, maybe in different ways, but always at work in mighty and powerful ways. Here in the book of Acts, in these verses, they follow and flow out of the finished work of Christ on the cross. They flow out of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and they manifest the supernatural power of God through the ministry of the church. God works supernaturally through his church by his grace and by his mercy. Here we see it in stark relief to the rest of the world. But God still works in and through his church, maybe in different ways. But God is still alive. God is still at work. We can still trust him. Verse 12. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. Notice signs and wonders. God is demonstrating. They didn't do the signs and wonders as the church. God did them. And he used the apostles establishing the truth of his word and the centrality of his kingdom for what he is establishing so that he drives home the truth that this is the kingdom of God and that God's kingdom is set apart from the world. It's unique. It's different. There is a God who is alive and real and these people are those who are promoting his work and his kingdom. And so they are faithful to, to the Lord in the proclamation of the word, and he is performing many signs and wonders regularly among the people. It's remarkable of what God is doing. Not things happening off on the side, but here through this group. They're all together. They have a unity together. Remember, Ananias and Sapphira have just died. And still all the believers are together. God is at work in a powerful way. The Lord is showing them the truth. And the world is seeing them. And, and notice, through the finished work of Christ on the cross, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the Lord is manifesting his supernatural power through the church's witness to the world. That still happens today. Notice how it happens here, verse 13 and 14. None of the rest dared join them. But the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women Isn't that remarkable? Nobody dared join them. Now think about the church and our witness today. We want to see people come to know the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We want to proclaim the truth. But sometimes we plead. Sometimes we dumb down the message. Sometimes people in the church compromise the truth. 
There have been times for me when I've spoken to somebody about the gospel, they put their faith in Christ, and I try to talk them out of it. That might sound really strange. I want to make sure they really understand. We want to call people to put their faith in Christ. We want to recognize that here we have a high and a holy picture of the church. Nobody dared join them. Nobody wanted to come near them. In fact, the, the word can even carry that idea that they don't want to get close to them. You know, when you're standing next to somebody, they say something that's, that's really bad or blasphemous or something, you just kind of want to step away because you're afraid lightning's going to strike them. I don't get close to those people. Look at Ananias and Sapphira. They take the church seriously. They hold them in high esteem. Nobody dare join them, but the Lord, by his sovereign grace and mercy, continues to work in the hearts of people, drawing people to himself so that salvation is real, not pseudo. People are sobered. The church is proclaiming a holy God. Jesus' fulfillment of the law, his forgiveness. But he's also calling people to honest humility. If Ananias and Sapphira, that message would have come through loud and clear. Don't lie to God. They notice, too, that this finished work of Christ on the cross, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, manifests the supernatural power of God through the church's compassionate ministry to those in need. Everything points us back to God himself as the supernatural, almighty, all-powerful God. We see the proclamation of the church pointing people to the Lord Jesus. Look at verses 15 and 16. So that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. We know of people that, that go to faith healers. People that are genuinely sick. I've seen God heal people before, not through a faith healer. There's a blind presumption that often happens. Here we have a picture of God by his spirit and by his power. He is working so powerfully that even somebody in Peter's shadow is healed. Notice the kind of healing that goes on here. It's physical healing, but it's also spiritual healing from unclean spirits. And people are coming even from the surrounding region. And so you have Acts chapter 1, verse 8. If you think of that as an outline of the book of Acts, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea. Here you see Judea coming to Jerusalem. The they, we don't really know for sure who they are that are bringing the sick. They could be non-believers. They could be new believers. They could be old believers. But people are being brought so that they will be healed. God is powerfully working in his church. And God still works powerfully in and through his church. He does it in different ways. We are still to be people who are compassionate. We are still to be people who point other people to the living God. 
we're still to be those who want to seek people who need Christ and point them to the Lord Jesus. We want to encourage one another. And we want to see that we serve the living God, the all-powerful God. Here through these verses, we see the supernatural power of God actively working in and through his church, pointing them to God's grace and mercy. And we are to be God's church in a fallen, blind, angry, broken world. A lost world. When we come to worship, we're just not getting together to be just a bunch of nice people who like to hang out. We come to meet together with the living God in his presence, knowing that God is here with us when we gather together in his name, knowing that he will work in our hearts and lives, knowing that he will move us, that he will shape us, that he will direct us, that he will be alive and is alive and is at work, and that we can come to him in prayer and faith and trust and know that this almighty, all-powerful, all-holy, all-righteous God has called us who trust in the Lord Jesus out of darkness. He has placed us in his family. We belong to him, and we will see him work. Have you ever called somebody because the Lord put them on your heart? And that call happened at just the right time? And they tell you that? Has somebody called you at just the right time? Has something happened where you were down and you happened to look at Scripture and the very passage you looked at spoke to your soul? You think that happened by chance? God, in his sovereign mercy, before the foundation of the world, ordained that you would look at that passage that day and be encouraged. The God that we serve is a holy, righteous, loving, compassionate God who comes to us in a fallen, broken world and saves us from our sin and pulls back the curtain so that we see the beauties of what God does in and through his church and calls us to put our faith, our trust, our hope in him to know that he has called us out of this world to proclaim his truth and to have a ministry to the people around us. Let's pray. Father, we thank and praise you for your great love and mercy that you have called us out of this fallen, dark, broken, blind, confused world by coming into our hearts and taking us from death to life, convicting us of our sin and forgiving us in Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you are the almighty God. We ask that you forgive us when we doubt your power, when we doubt your love, when we doubt your mercy. We ask that you forgive us when we bring you down to our level to think that you are like us, Forgive us. Open the eyes of our hearts that we might see you as the creator, sustainer, the God who has loved our souls perfectly. We ask in Jesus' holy name. 
Amen.